Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so... Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Don't worry, I'm not playing on my phone. I just got my PowerPoint on here. Lies. <laughs> Ouch, that's triple. Okay, so this week's Torah portion, who knows what it is? Lech. Everyone say lech. Lecha. Okay, it's really fun sounding. Lech lecha. Everyone say it together. Ready? Lech lecha. Okay. What on earth does that mean? I, I always feel bad for the first time visitors. Like they're making us face a direction, we're singing words we don't understand, saying all these funny things, there's a chug going on, am I in the right place? Um, Lech Lecha is just Hebrew for go for yourself, right, to go forth. This is the portion where we are in Genesis, uh, starting with chapter 12, where God calls Abraham, and he tells Abraham to, to go, you know, get out from where he's at. Now, it's, what's really cool, what's really interesting is this is the third Torah portion, correct? Right, we started over in Genesis after Sukkot. And since then, we've only had two Shabbats. We've only had two Torah portions. And yet in those two Torah portions, we've covered like 2,000 years of the history of the entire, everything that's in the Torah, we've covered over 2,000 years of that history. We've covered over 80%, uh, if you're you're just counting by years and timeline, over 80% of the timeline of the entire Torah in two weeks. And now the rest of the year, the rest of Scripture is focused, okay, on less than 500 years. It's focused on one man and this man's family and what becomes of his family. Is that incredible? That's amazing. You would think, you know, we're always hungry for details about Genesis, right? Like, what did Noah, what, did, what about this, what, what about, ooh, what about the Tower of Babel, what was that really about? And yet God finds it important to, to focus in the majority of the Torah, the vast majority of the Torah, on this one man's family and the example that he sets. I don't know about you, that means we should probably really pay attention to this man's life, his relationship with God, the example that is set forth in him when it comes to our own walk with God, right? Would that make sense? Yeah, it's that, it's that uh, 80-20 rule you hear about, right? Okay, the 80% is focused on this 20%, Abraham, his family, his life, and in this week's Torah portion, as we cover the beginning of uh, Avram, okay, originally his name, Avram's journey with God, his walk with God, his relationship with God, we cover so many foundational principles and truths. And, and this uh, week, today on Shabbat, um, we're going to be covering a really important topic, something that is vastly important to the life of Abraham, something that is very incredibly such a core foundational principle for each and every one of our lives. It sets the tone for the rest of Scripture. It's foundational to Paul's mission and his letters. We're going to cover something that's just very, very important and very, very uh, applicable and relevant to each and every one of us. Does that excite you? Right? There's a lot of times maybe in certain Scriptures or passages we're like, I don't really see how that, what I do with that, you know, how to, how does this apply, you know, to me? This one is going to be very, very applicable to each and every one of us and to uh, just a lot of things in general. So, Lech Lecha, we're going to be talking about faith. Everyone say faith. Faith, faith and the pattern of salvation and all, all these various things. Um, the, word, the word faith in Hebrew is emunah. Everyone say emunah. That's a fun word, right? Don't flip any of the letters, you might get some uh, interesting combos, but emunah, okay? <laughs> emunah means faith. Everyone say emunah. emunah. Faith. Faith is such an important topic, okay? It's really simple, but a lot of times we overcomplicate it because of our own, you know, denominational preferences and theological differences and things, but we're going to try and get back, hopefully, to make it, make it real simple And what we see, uh, the pattern that's lived out with the life of Abraham. Emunah is faith. Faith is what? Faith is belief, right? Faith is trust. Faith is being able to stand firm on something, to rely on it, to trust it, to to believe in it. 
okay? As, as one of my teachers always likes to, uh, to point out, Brad, you know, he always brings up, when, it, when all of us came here today and we sat in our chairs, you know, none of you checked your chairs. None of you were suspicious about whether your chair was going to work or not. You came in, you sat down in your chair. Why? Because you, you had faith, you had trust that the chair was going to hold you, that it wasn't going to fall apart. Why? Because, well, you've had some experience with chairs, right? You've sat in a lot of chairs in your lifetime, and, and they don't really fall through. Now, some of us might not trust chairs uh, as of recent, like Mr. Kennedy, but that's another story. So there's that kind of faith and trust that's based on an experience, okay? If you get the same thing over and over and over again, it's easy to now trust, to believe, to rely on that. But there's another type of faith where you might not have the experience you know, behind it. It wasn't like Abraham's like, oh, yeah, God's told me to go several places before. You know, it's like sometimes there's things we're, we're not sure of, we don't have experience with, we haven't mastered it, and we have to step out in faith and trust. What's cool about this word emunah, faith, is, um, you know, it comes from the root of the aleph and the mem, and there's a few other words that come from this root. One is the, is the Hebrew word for pillar, also comes from the same root. Why? A pillar is something that, right? holds up, that supports. It's something you can trust, rely on, depend on, like faith, being, being able to trust, rely, depend. Another word that comes from the same root is mother. The word mom, the word M or ima. How cool is that? How many of you just have that awesome mother that you can always rely on, depend on, trust, that, that's always been there for you? I know I definitely have one of the greatest moms in world history. And so it... No, I'm being serious. Don't laugh. Um... <laughs> It helps shape your idea of faith when you look at all these words, a mother, a pillar, okay? Faith, trust, de- being able to depend and rely on something. That's what faith is all about. I want to look real quick at a verse before we get into Genesis and life of Abraham, and that's in Habakkuk, or as, as we say, Habakkuk, okay? Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, where it says this, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by what? by his faith. Okay, this is, a, this is a key, important scripture. Paul quotes this scripture many times. We speak about the scripture. The just shall live by faith. If we're, if we're just, we live by faith. We live by trust. So let's go ahead and dive in to a few things of the life of Abraham. I'm, I'm going to cover some brief points and then talk about the example that's set in him. We're going to go ahead and skip and start into chapter 15. So we're going to skip, uh, you know, he calls him out, okay? Abraham goes through a couple mini exiles. Uh, we see some things happen. We see some wars and battles. But we're going to dig into chapter 15. So let's start there, everyone. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 15 and starting with verse 1. And it says this. Genesis 15, 1 through 6. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Avram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Avram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Avram said, My Lord, Yahweh, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Avram said, Look, You have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in Yahweh, and he accounted it to him, for what? For righteousness. So we know that the, when God appears to Avram in Genesis chapter 12, he says, look, I'm going to make you a multitude of nations. I'm gonna, your children are going to be so numerous. It's going to be like the stars of heaven, like the sands of the sea. We see now he reconfirms this uh, to Avram a, a few chapters later, say, look up at the stars. This is how numerous your descendants will be. And Avram did what? He trusted. He had faith. He knew that God meant what he said, that he was serious, that this was going to happen. He says, but, you know, I haven't had any kids. You, you've given me this promise. It's, it's been a little while now. You know, what's going on? Is, is my servant in my house going to inherit? He says, no, 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 someone from your own 
from your own body. It's going to be your child. And he believes God, and God says what? It was counted to him for righteousness. For the rest of the chapter, we then see a covenant laid out. But let's go ahead and skip to the next chapter, chapter 16, starting with verse 1. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. Now Sarai, Avram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Avram, See now, Yahweh has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Avram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Avram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Avram to be his wife. After Avram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went in to Hagar, and she conceived, and then we read the rest of the chapter, the drama that unfolds and that is still unfolding to this day, every day, on the news, this one mistake that has affected thousands of years of world history, has caused havoc and chaos, this one mistake, Abram's like the biggest mistake, maybe that's just my opinion, he ever made in his life, just verses after, and he trusted in God. And it was counted to him for righteousness. Yes, Abram, the example, the prime example, the father of faith, right? Isn't that what we say? He's the father of our faith, father Abraham. And verses later, makes one of the biggest mistakes in world history that like has devastated so many lives. Oh my gosh. I mean, what's going on? How, how, how long did it say he was at least dwelling in the land of Canaan? Ten years. That's hard for me to comprehend, okay? I'm 22 years old, okay? So if I go back 10 years, I'm 12. I don't have quite a grip on 10 years, you know. Maybe for some of you older, more experienced people in the room, 10 years, you can kind of comprehend how long that is. But for me, it's like 10 years. It's like almost a lifetime, you know, 10 years. Um, <laughs> it's like 10 years, oh my gosh. Well, it is. It's a long time. Um, it's like almost 50% of my life. So it's a little hard for me, but I'm, I'm getting there. But think about that. God makes Abram a promise. You are going to have so many descendants that you're going to have entire nations. They're going to be like stars in the sky. It's going to be like the sand of the seashore. And he goes at least 10 years with absolutely no evidence whatsoever of this coming about. At least minimum 10 years, not one single child, not one single first step towards that goal of God's promise. Think about that. Think about promises uh, you have held on to or promises God has made in your life and how, you know, 10 uh, days go by and you're already asking, or 10 months go by. Imagine over 10 years and there's not even a f- evidence of a first step. It's not, like he's, it's not like 10 years go by and it's like, okay, God, I've only had, you know, I only have 20 descendants now. What's going on? No, not one single child, Sarah, barren. And no evidence of things getting better. Can we kind of relate and see why Avram slipped into doubt? How doubt started to maybe creep in and and why him and Sarai decided to make the decision they made with the whole, you know, Ishmael thing. It seemed, I mean, it seemed right, right? It's been over 10 years. This isn't happening. Maybe, you know, maybe we kind of have to go a different route with this. Maybe we have to... you know, it's been over 10 years. I must be doing something wrong. God must want me to, to, you know, work it around this way. How many times do we compromise on God's promise? How many times do we take something that God has promised us, has said is true, that we can depend on, rely on, and because of time, because of lack of patience, because of doubt and fear, maybe I'm not doing something right. Maybe God's not happy with me anymore. Maybe God hasn't chosen me anymore. And now we allow those doubts and those fears to cause us to compromise on what God's promise is and what comes out of that. 
Nothing but chaos and disaster and, and things that are not good. And so I, I find it just kind of not funny. Funny is not the right word, but it's just so interesting that the father of our faith, the prime example in Scripture, this is what you know, faith in God is like, had one of the biggest acts of non-faith. Do you think God knew he was going to do that? Still declared him righteous. Chapter earlier, because of his faith. Declared him righteous because of his faith, knowing that not too soon after he was going to slip up very bad. Think about that. Okay, the rest of chapter 16, like I said, we have the Ishmael drama. Let's, let's skip. Let's go ahead to Genesis 17, verses 1 through 5. Genesis chapter 17, 1 through 5. So we've 15, 16. Now we're at the beginning of 17, last chapter of this week's Torah portion. When Avram was 99 years old, whoo, 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 whoo. Okay, so this is now 13 years. We know, right, uh, Ishmael was 13 years old when this took place. Uh, this is now 13 years after the previous chapter. These chapters jump quite a bit. You know, it's not like it's just happening one after another. When Avram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Avram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Avram, but your name shall be Avraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And he gives him once again the promise of, of many descendants. Avram's like, hey, well, Ishmael, you know, may Ishmael live before you. And he's like, hey, we'll bless Ishmael. I mean, he'll, he'll do good. You know, he'll, he'll become some nations and I'll bless him and I'll take care of him. But it's from Sarah, okay? You're, you're going to have another son. The promise is, is going to be from, from you and Sarah, and we see that God ratifies and makes this covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, and now there's uh, a sign to the covenant. Okay, this is when uh, circumcision and all this is introduced is here in chapter 17, okay? Over at least minimum of 23 years after the initial covenant and promise we see in Genesis chapter 15. So it's really interesting. Now, I want to take what we've seen here with Avram, with these different steps, and I want to go into some key passages that I think are going to be really relevant and helpful. How many of you know someone or have people or have heard of people who are totally against you keeping God's commandments or wanting to live the Torah, right? Because it's works, right? Anyone ever heard? Okay. How many of you have heard the opposite? No, it's, we're justified by our works. I mean, we got to bear fruit. We got to have something to present, and that's what counts before God. Not, it's not this just, you know, believe nonsense. How many of you have heard that? Okay. I've heard both these sides, you know. I've heard bickering on both. Oh, you're keeping that. You're trying to be justified by works. You're, you're you know, you're trampling on the side and this and that. Now there's, oh, you know, no, you think you can just believe? Even the demons believe, you know. No, we have to have fruit. He says you got to bear fruit. If you don't bear fruit, you're going to be cut down. And we have these two sides constantly bickering against each other. Now, I'm by no means an expert, but I, I just think God is, is very simple in his message, that it's something he wants the whole world to understand, that reconciliation, that living a life for God, that believing in the scripture is something that's simple that anyone can grab onto. That it's not some overly complicated theological process that we muddy up and confuse with our semantics and our opinions and our, right, our own desires. And I'd submit to you that it's, it's not faith, it's not works, it's, it's a combination and a mixture of the both. So I want to dig through some key passages of some of Paul's letters that deal with this. How many of you know Paul is an important guy? We shouldn't downplay Paul. Okay, Paul is a very important guy. His words are extremely important to us. How many of you, raise your hand in the room, are not of Jewish descent? 
okay? The, the majority, okay? We've got Doc over here. Shalom. Good to have you, brother. Uh, but the majority, majority of us in the room, okay, not from Jewish descent. Well, guess what? Yeshua, the Spirit of God, specifically called Paul, anointed him, gave him the message to announce the kingdom of God to those who are not of Jewish descent. So if you raise your hand, Paul is very important because God handpicked him, filled him with his spirit to talk to me about how I get into the kingdom of God. Because I'm not Jewish. Okay. He had Peter, he had James, he had tons of people. Okay, for the Jewish people, he specifically said, Paul, you're crazy enough, this will work. You got to go and tell these people that they can now come in. It's very important. He also gave an example. Yes, he also, yes, he also I don't want to exclude, he also did give some good words that uh, are for the Jewish people as well. Um, he does mention that in, in his letter. So let's go ahead. I want to start with a verse from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 28. Now, the book of Romans is a letter to the Romans, okay? We're not going to go through the entire letter. I encourage you, though, when you read the letter, read the whole letter, okay? None of you, when you get a letter or a message from a friend, a family member, Divide that letter up into chapters and verses. You just read the letter, okay? So when you go home and you decide to read some of the Romans, read the whole thing. Is it going to take some time? Yes. Get over it. I mean, it's not that bad. Like, don't be lazy. Just read the whole letter, okay? If you want to sit down, take some passages from Galatians, read the whole book of Galatians, then maybe go back and focus in a little bit, okay? But they're letters. You have to read the whole thing. That being said, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Do it at home. It's your homework. <laughs> We're going to read a lot of it, though. Okay, Book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 28. <laughs> Maybe I am of Jewish descent. Yeah. Therefore, we conclude. Okay, prime example. Therefore, we conclude. Means he said a bunch of stuff before that built up to that statement. So go read it. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by what? A man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the Torah. Don't throw any rocks yet, okay? Just, just be patient. Hold on. Therefore, we conclude that the man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the Torah. In uh, many of Paul's uh, writings, he uses Abraham as, as his ex- example. Abraham being the one that, through him, we have a promise, us, us non-Jews, us descendants of other peoples, because we know that the promise was made to Abraham that uh, through Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We know that this was through his seed. We know that that seed was Messiah. And so it's because of Abraham and the promise made to Abraham that we have hope in the kingdom of God through Messiah, those of us who are grafted in by Messiah. And Paul makes the case that this is by faith, that this is not about how good you are in keeping commandments. So this is not about how many commandments you keep. It's not about what, you, okay, what you're performing on the outside that justifies you. It is by your faith, your faith alone, apart from the deeds of the Torah. That is what is going to justify you. Now remember, we're dealing with a time period in which okay, non-Jews are coming into the kingdom. And we see even within the New Testament that there's some kind of, not fighting, but some kind of like butting of heads with Paul and and James and Peter and some of these guys about how this works. There's a group of people that are intimidating the early believers and saying, hey, if these guys want to get in and be like us in order to be a part of the people of Israel, in order to be a part of this kingdom, you have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Then, okay, you can be one of us. You have to get circumcised. You have to go through this conversion process. You have to do all these things and then you can be a part of the kingdom of God. And there's a lot of pressure with that we see in the New Testament. We see things like, uh, I believe it was uh, Peter, you know. He would be really friendly with the Gentiles, okay. He would eat with them. He would, you know, fellowship with them. But then when those of the circumcision, and in the New Testament, the circumcision refers to this group of people that believe, no, you have to go through these steps of proper conversion before you can be a part of the the kingdom of God and enter into this promise. When they would come around, he would like sneak away and hide and and not eat with Gentiles, not fellowship with Gentiles. Why? Because they're unclean. You're not supposed to eat with them. You're not supposed to share a meal with them. They're out of covenant. You can't have a meal with them. You can't 
sit down with them, okay? And so we see Paul openly calling them out, you hypocrite, you know, and we, we see like kind of them button heads constantly as, you know, because they're people, they're human, okay? They're not infallible, Paul, Peter, these guys, I mean, they're, they're humans just like us. You know, Yeshua picked a handful of humans to carry on his mission. So we have to understand that this controversy is going on of how do these Gentiles get into the kingdom of God? How do they come into this faith? Paul says they're justified by faith apart from the deeds of the Torah. No circumcision required, no this required, no this required. Let's get into some of the meat of it in the next chapter, Romans chapter 4, starting with verse 1. Now, many of you have heard these verses and have these verses quoted at you in, in an attempt to say, look, don't keep the commandments of God. They're not important. Don't keep the Torah. These things aren't relevant to you anymore. I submit to you that's not what that means, and Paul will explain himself and what it means. What then? Shall we say that Avraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? What has Abraham found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, so Paul makes his case based on Abraham. If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And now he quotes the verse we read in Genesis 15. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. He quotes from King David, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And then verse 8, blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he may be the father of all those who believe though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Paul makes a really good case here. Paul makes... Um, sorry. Paul makes some really good points here in that he, he looks to Abraham and says, you know, what did, what did Abraham do? What did Abraham do to become righteous? He trusted in God. That's it. If it was a, a checklist of things that Abraham had to check off, what is there to be excited about? What, what do you give glory to God for when you accomplished it by yourself? When you go to work and you work hard and you put in the hours and you do all the tasks that your employer, right, tells you to do, and then you get your check, do you then like jump up and celebrate and like, oh, the gracious, compassionate employer who has so beneficently granted me with this? And you're like, no, give me my, you know, give, <laughs> that's right, finally. You missed, actually, some of this was overtime. You missed a little bit, if you can, okay? No one celebrates the graciousness, okay? When you do what you're supposed to do and you get what was promised to you, that, what's, what's so great about that? You can boast in what you've done. Yeah, I did this and this and this. And because I did this, this, and this, I earned what I duly deserve. Paul says this is not what happened to Abraham at all. Abraham had faith in God. God granted him righteousness, even though, as he says, the, the one who justifies the ungodly. Even though in the very next few verses, Abraham slips up and makes one of the biggest mistakes ever, one of the biggest sins of doubt and unbelief ever, world history, that was not what justified him. God did not wait till Abraham was a man who can perfectly walk out his faith until he called him and made covenant with him. He called him and made covenant with him because he knew Abraham would believe. And when you believe and you trust in God, you make yourself a usable vessel 
someone who is willing to be taught, someone to his, who is willing to learn and grow. And as long as you are usable and willing and available to God, he can take care of the rest. He can teach you the rest. This is not hard. Keeping Shabbat is not hard. Not eating pig is not hard. Anyone can do that. That's not impressive to God. It's not impressive to me. You can have a total jerk who has none of the characteristics of God inside him at all, and he can rest on the seventh day, and he can wear seats, and he can keep the commandments of God. That's not impressive to God. He can teach anyone how to do that. What is impressive to God is someone who is willing to say, God, I believe in you, I trust you, use me, whatever it takes. And now that he has a willing vessel, he can teach them the rest as they go along. And so Paul makes this argument that it's that faith that justified him. Abraham was no less God's servant in chapter 12 than he was in chapter 15 than he was in chapter 17 when he got circumcised, that he will be chapters later when he finally walks out his faith by offering up Isaac. He was no less God's servant than any of those. He was just as willing. He was just as faithful. He had to grow. He had to learn some new commandments along the way. He had to mature in, in his process. But what made him God's servant? His faith. And so Paul makes this argument. This is what justifies a man. Abraham did not have to get circumcised and pass all these tests and go through all these things before God called him. God called him, and then God perfected him. Does that make sense? Am I losing anyone? Okay. This is a really crucial, like I said, key foundational message to our theology, to the rest of Scripture, to how we interact with others who would tell us not to keep the Torah. Because, trust me, I'm not saying don't, don't keep the Torah. It has its place. But right now we're talking about justification. We're talking about entering the kingdom of God. We're talking about your relationship with God and how that works. If Abraham would have died the next day after Genesis chapter 15, never having been circumcised, never having, you know, wore tzitzi, never having do, do, done any of those things, he was still just as faithful and righteous in God's eyes. It's the fact that he was a usable vessel. Let's skip now down to, to verse 23. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, Paul says. And he says this elsewhere, that everything written in the Torah is for our examples. That's why we read the Torah. That's why we have the Torah portions. That's why the Torah is relevant to us, because these are all examples for us. It was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Yeshua our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Paul says the example of Abraham is for you because the way you will also be justified before God is having faith in his promise through the Messiah. Abraham had faith in God's promise. He was righteous. If you have faith in God's promise through Yeshua the Messiah, you are now a willing, usable, usable vessel. If you truly have faith in Yeshua the Messiah and the promise that God has through him, if he tells you to do something, you'll do it. If he tells you to change, you'll change. If he tells you to grow, you'll grow. But the fact is, that's what counts. That's where you begin. That's where you start. And that's ultimately what matters in the eyes of God is that faith that's within you. Now, a lot of, some of you are probably just really ready to strangle me right now. But it's okay. We're now going to get into the other side of argument. We talked about Paul. Paul, the guy who is, you know, button heads with, we'll go with this other gentleman now, uh, Mr. James, Mr. Jacob. Let's go to the book of James. Chapter 2, starting with verse 14. Now, who's James? Who's Jacob? Yeshua's brother, okay, <laughs> whoa, okay, he kind of has that trump card, you know, they could probably, I'm sure he used it, he's, come on, like I said, these guys are human, he's got to be like, oh, he appeared to you in a vision, yeah, we, I was raised with him, okay, like, <laughs> talk about vision, okay, I have some visions you don't even want to know about, he was my brother, okay, I'm, I'm sure, come on, like, just knowing the nature of people, I mean. 
But anyways, James. So what does James say? Because now James tackles the same exact topic, kind of. Uses the same verses that Paul uses. And at least if, if you're not looking at the grand scheme of Scripture, and it's just theological denominational battles, faith versus works, ding, 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 okay? If, if you're just being, you know, this is what I believe, and I'm going to prove what I believe by quoting James, okay? Then it can appear that James and Paul are like using the same verses, the same concept, the same material, and coming to two opposite conclusions, two contradictory conclusions. In reality, as we know, they're not. So start with James chapter 2, starting with verse 14. What does it profit, my brother, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? The implied answer is no, okay, which is, would seem to completely contradict what Paul said. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do nothing, you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Okay? He kind of brings up this... this Silly attitude we get in. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. I, I can't help but sense like sarcasm all throughout like what James, like he's like really like punching it. Do you notice that? Like, you know, you show me your faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. Oh, you believe? That's nice. So do the demons, you know? Like I can hear me fighting with one of my brothers. <clears throat> I'm serious, like, you can totally tell. Like, it's like, man. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Wait, what? Wasn't Abraham justified by faith? According to James, no. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son up on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect. Now notice something interesting. James isn't leaving out faith. He's not making this works-centric. He's saying that what? He just said that by Abraham's works, his faith was what? Perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So, so James says, yeah, yeah, okay, his faith, okay, made him righteous, but that wasn't fulfilled until his works showed his faith, until they caught up with his faith. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by what? By works and not by faith alone, not by faith only. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Paul's, right? Faith apart from the works of the Torah. James, like, works. Gotta have works. Okay? Which is it? Both, right? Both. Okay? Both. If you truly, like I, like I said earlier, if you truly believe God, if you truly trust in God, that will show up in your life. Okay, if I ran in the room, if someone ran in the room, if Lance ran in the room, it's like, hey, guys, okay, there's some, like, Muslims with AK-47s. They're headed this way. They're screaming, let's kill those people. If you believed Lance in your heart and sat in your chair, you going to die, okay? And I would submit to you, you didn't really believe Lance, no sane person, knowing that fact, would not do something about it. If you truly have faith and trust in Lance, you will get off your chair. You will either go hide or you will go grab your weapon, okay, because something is about to happen. It's the same with God. If you truly trust and believe God that he has made a way for you to be in his kingdom 
through the Messiah, Yeshua, and all he asks for you to do is to give your life completely to him, to take up his word, to take up now his will, to die to yourself and to live in him, if you truly believe that, you would be a crazy person, and I would submit that you don't really believe it if you didn't do it. If you didn't begin living out and saying, okay, how do I do this? And begin taking those steps. It's both. Everyone say that. It's both. If you want more evidence, I mean, let's go back to Paul in his own words. Paul is writing a letter about justification. The theme and the topic is how do Gentiles get into the congregation? How do Gentiles get into the kingdom of God? Paul is writing how they get in, not how they live the rest of their life. Paul's writing about how they get in. He's making the case by, it's by faith. Yes, they'll learn as they go, but that's not Paul's topic. His topic is justification. That's why he's pounding on faith so hard because it's really easy to hold people accountable to what they do rather than their faith in God. It's really easy to judge them by their fruit rather than the fact that they do have the seed within them and we're just not seeing their fruit yet. God forbid we judge people that way because if God would have judged us that way, if God would have judged Abraham that way, if God would have judged the children of Israel that way, none of us would be here today. Romans 3.31, Paul, I mean, Paul includes this. Do we then make void the Torah because of faith? Certainly not. God forbid, on the contrary, we establish the Torah. So Paul's message is, is very clearly about justification, not about how you live the rest of your life, not about how that faith is perfected, not about how that justification and that new relationship with God is grown and matured. He covers that in other passages. He begins to cover that in chapters 6 and 7, I believe, even talks about the struggle within himself. He talks about that in other letters. That's why we have to read the whole letter. That's why you have to look at the context. I want to take a passage of Galatians. Now, once again, go read the whole thing. I'm not gonna. And it just take too long. I mean, let's just be honest. You know, we don't have like an eight-hour, okay? This is not yeshiva. So anyways, Galatians chapter 6, verse 13 through 15. Now, once again, circumcision refers to a group of people that believe in this conversion process in order for one to enter the kingdom of God before they can be allowed in. The uncircumcision refers to the people who are not of that preference. Galatians chapter 6, verses 13 through 15. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Okay, Paul's writing. Remember, this is in the middle of a letter. Go read the rest for the context. But he says, for not even those who are circumcised keep the Torah. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast. See, this is the heart of the message. This is what he's trying to get across. Listen to this. God forbid that I should, should boast except in the cross of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For I in Messiah, for, for in Messiah Yeshua, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but what? A new creation. He's saying, even my own people, even the Jewish people, okay, we don't keep the Torah perfectly. You know, we don't, we're not meeting the standards. We have to become a new creation. We have to walk in the steps of our Father. Remember what John the Baptist said as the Pharisees were coming out as he was baptizing people. He said, you hypocrites, okay? Who, why did you come? You need to bear fruits worthy of repentance. You need to be, what, what was John preaching? Born again, right? Being immersed, having repentance. And, he's, and John the Baptist specifically says in two different books when they're coming out, okay? We have it recorded twice. As they're coming out, he says, and do not even think to say that Abraham is your father, as if that's some impressive thing. He says, God could raise up children to Abraham from these rocks. So what's Paul saying? He's saying, even those who keep, even those who are circumcised, even those who have the right checklist, the right bloodline, we are even faulted when it comes to the Torah. We are even guilty if we are being judged by the letter of the law. And yet, we want to tell you that you have to go through this, this, and this, and this, and this for you to enter the kingdom of God and be justified before God so that you can boast in what you've done and what you've accomplished, that you pass the checklist. He said, God forbid that we ever boast in anything except for the Messiah, Yeshua. 
That's the only thing we can boast in. And he says what? Neither circumcision or uncircumcision is anything but what? A new creation. Abraham was justified when, when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Uncircumcised. Because he believed in his heart. Because he had a change of heart. Because he had the spirit of God inside him. That's what counted to God. And each and every one of us have to have a change of heart, have to have a renewed heart. That's what Jeremiah 31 teaches with the new covenant. That's what Ezekiel 37 teaches with the new covenant, that he will put his spirit inside of us and cause us to walk in his ways. It's the change in our hearts that has to happen. Not our bloodlines, not what we've done to check off our, you know, Israel membership card list or whatever, That's not impressive to God. Prime example. Man on the cross. Right? Next to Yeshua. Did he ever get baptized? Did he ever, you know, did he ever get circumcised? Maybe he was Jewish and he already was. I don't know. But did he ever learn, right, the right steps to take? Did he ever... Is he saved? Did he, did he have reconciliation? Yes. Yeshua said, I tell you today, this man, he's going to be with me in paradise. Why? Because in that moment, he had a change of heart. In that moment, he had faith. Now, if it was a true faith, and if it was a true change of heart, given time, that man would have walked out steps of obedience. But those aren't required to get you in. Those are just the evidence that appears when the faith, what really matters, is truly there. Were, were you any less a servant of God? Were you any less saved by Yeshua the Messiah when you were going to church on Sunday and eating pork? If you would have died in that moment, would God have said, I'm sorry, you still had a few more things to learn. I'm sorry, you still had a few more things to do. What counts is your faith. If that faith doesn't show up in your works through time, it's not a true faith and you're a hypocrite. But what counts is the faith. If the seed is real, fruit will appear on the tree. Does that make sense, everyone? I might might be being really repetitive, but I'm just trying to say it in as many ways as possible. Really make sure this gets across. Now then, obviously, we need to be producing fruit. Because if we're not producing fruit, we're hypocrites and liars, right? Right? But it's not the fruit that saves us. You can't tape. I've said this before like a billion times, so I'm not sure if I've said it here or not. You can't take a bunch of peaches, okay, and apples and all this fruit, go up to a dead tree, duct tape all this fruit around this dead tree, and then hope that, right, when, when he comes around, he's, he's coming like, who did this? <laughs> all right, let me take the fruit. And the tree's firewood, okay? It's still being chopped down. Likewise, we can't put on Shabbat, kosher, tzitzit. If the faith's not within us, we're not fooling anyone but ourselves and the people around us. The tree's still dead. It doesn't matter how much fruit you have. It doesn't matter how much works you have. It doesn't matter how much Torah you have because what counts is the faith. It will produce the works. But you got to have the faith. You don't have the faith. You just keep all the commandments and you're not, it's not real in your heart. You're not fooling. You're firewood, okay? It's just not going to be good. Well, I mean, that's what he says. So let's look at some practical verses about this. Did, has this been a, made a little sense about like Paul's stuff, hopefully, and been beneficial? Because, guys, Paul's awesome. I mean, like, we can't downplay Paul because people misuse him. Just like we can't downplay Torah because people misuse it. You know, we, we can't downplay any piece of Scripture due to our biases. Okay, we do that because of fear, because of lack of understanding, when really we just need to change our understanding and allow the Spirit of God to, to help reshape our understanding and not shy away from any part of Scripture because it's all true and it's all good and beneficial. Anyways, Matthew 25, starting with verse 20. So he who had received five talents, we're going halfway into the parable of the talents. I'm sure many of you have heard the parable of the talents many times. Master goes away, gives his servants talents, okay? So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents. He had made five more. 
saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received the two came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We know the person with one did nothing with it. And what does he say? You know, depart from me, weeping and gnashing of teeth, all this stuff. Those of us who have entered into the faith in Messiah Yeshua need to see that produce fruit in our lives. We need to see that be lived out. We, we need to have fruit, okay, for his coming. Don't let this message of faith is what matters and faith is what justifies allow us to become slack and say, well, you know, as long as I have my faith, you know, because once again, it has to produce fruit. And if he shows up in that day and we've done nothing with what he's given us, okay, I don't want to hear those words. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And another beautiful, encouraging passage here is John chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 where Yeshua says this, so beautiful. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, which kind of like makes me giggle. It's like, even if you're doing what's right, even if you're bearing fruit, be prepared, okay, for some pruning. Okay, it's it's just inevitable. You're not going to escape the challenges and trials of life that it may bear even more fruit. He does it for a reason and a purpose. The trials we each go through is for us to even bear more and more fruit of that faith that's within us. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And then listen, listen to this. Abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Wow. Once again, what counts? Faith. What counts? That relationship we have with Yeshua. If that's authentic, if that's true, you're going to have some awesome fruit. If you're trying to produce fruit without that relationship with him, without faith, it's going to be not good, stinky, useless, rotten fruit. But if we're in Yeshua, the Messiah will produce great fruit because he renews us from the inside out. And we will see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We'll see someone who wants to keep his will, the will of the Father. So here are like some takeaway points. I don't have like, once again, like this is just my opinion, you know. This is just my take on it and I hope it's a blessing and a benefit. So here are some like points I threw together. This isn't like, you know, this isn't the scripture. It's like, these are the four keys. You know, this is just things that I noticed. So feel free to add to them and, you know, adjust it. Um, I hate those cheesy things. Like, the five keys, you know, to having the pure, authentic faith. You know, I'm like, who, who writes like that? I've never read Moses, you know, just these four quick, easy steps, and you will be, <laughs> like, who, who came up with that? I never read Yeshua or anyone saying that. The tent, ah, uh, all right. The, my first takeaway was that what justifies? Faith, period, end of story, part from works, faith. You have faith and trust in God, you can be struck down the next second, not have been afforded the opportunity to produce a single fruit. It's that faith that counts in the eyes of God. Two, my second takeaway was that works and fruit are just the evidence of that faith, okay? If you're not struck down that next moment, okay, if you live several years, you'll see something. I mean, right? Is this really complicated? Is God's scripture message complicated? Not unless we get our own theology and, you know, denominational, you know, battles into it. It's really simple. Three, the solution is to what? Be dead to yourself and living in Yeshua as a new creation, right? Like Paul said, Circumcision, uncircumcision, what matters is, are you a new creation? And God will justify you just like he did our father Abraham. And fourth, boasting is only in what? It's only in Yeshua. 
It's not in our works. The works will show up. The works will appear in a true faith. Don't you dare even brag about how long you've been doing this and that and how many commandments you keep. There is no boasting but in the Messiah, Yeshua, period, end of story. It's about where you're headed on the journey. It's, it's about the direction you're headed on the journey, not about how far along you are. You can be right next to the finish line, and if you're laying down on your butt or if you're walking the wrong way, it doesn't matter that you're right next to the finish line. It doesn't matter how far you've gotten. What matters is that you're walking that way. Even if you're at the very starting line, you'll get there. You can be next to the finish line, not impressive unless you're still heading in that direction. That's why boasting is in Yeshua, not in how far you've gotten on your journey with Yeshua. The fact that you are still in him, you will eventually get there. And uh, yeah, those are my four takeaways. So I hope this has been a blessing. I hope this has been an encouragement. I know this is a little different than, you know, usual Lech Lecha reading and, and what we get into. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff we didn't cover and I'm sure we'll be brought up in Midrash. But thank you guys for this opportunity to, to get to share on the Torah portion. Uh, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, I think would be the best way. Yahweh, our righteous God, King of all the earth, we thank you for the gift of your scriptures once again the life that is in them, the beauty that is in your word, God. And I ask that as, as we dive in this Shabbat to your words, to your goodness, to your teachings, that you would uh, you truly implant it within us, that we would allow this to, to affect our lives, to make an impact on us, that it would go with us in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.